This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Guccio. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. So today we have Jill Carlson on the show. Jill is uh, one of the co-founders of the Open Money Initiative. Uh, formerly, she was an employee at uh, Chain. And the Open Money Initiative is um, a body, um, a, a sort of a research body that is uh, looking into open financial systems and creating uh, a space where you know more people can have access to open financial systems. And so Jill is quite active and interested in the situation in Venezuela at the moment, which, as most of you know, is quite dire. And uh, so with uh, this Open Money Initiative and with the help of partners, uh, they are uh, educating people there to um, you know, learn how to use Bitcoin and cryptocurrency to uh, do simple things like you know, potentially feed their families. And so we talked uh, with Jill for about an hour and a half about this. It's a really fascinating topic. Uh, it 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 gets a, it, it gets a little on the sort of like uh, edge of um, uh, you know, the, the 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 political spectrum when it comes to like our our propensity to try to stay away from political uh, topics, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Yeah, and a, and a lot of history there too about what happened in Venezuela the last couple of years. Sebastian, don't you think that cryptocurrencies are somewhat inherently a political uh, topic? Yeah, I. I I think so. I mean, she said something before the show, which um, which resonated with me, which is that you know cryptocurrencies are about a regulatory arbitrage to some extent. Um, I think that's true for some people. I think there are others, and I think I put myself in that category as well. That think that there are actually you know applications here that don't necessarily want to circumvent capital controls or regular you know or into regulatory arbitrage. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there there is something quite. You know, political uh, about cryptocurrencies, I think, generally. Yeah. Uh, and Jill also runs a uh, podcast called uh, What Grinds My Gears. Uh, and so, you know, people often ask me what, what which podcasts I listen to. And so basically there's three, which is uh, obviously Epicenter. You know, I, I listen to all the episodes that I don't host myself. Uh, Planet Money from NPR. And then uh, What Grinds My Gears. I think their, I think their podcast is really cool because, like, you know, her, she runs it with Meltem Demirers uh, and it's very like, you know, they have both have a deep history in like finance. And so it's very interesting getting that perspective. Like, you know, our, our podcast tends to be very technical. They approach crypto from just a very just like financial perspective and getting it's, it's a really interesting podcast. So I definitely suggest people check that out. Yeah, I've, I've listened to uh, one or two episodes and uh, I, uh, I'm going to add it to my my list. Um, so you were at uh, New York Blockchain Week last week. Uh, I, I was you know, trying not to pay too much attention to that because it just seemed like a whole bunch of craziness. But yeah, how was that? What was that like? Yeah, I was at uh, New York Blockchain Week last week, like, I, and it was a pretty you know interesting event uh, or week. You know, lots of meetings and stuff. Uh, I know a lot of people like think New York Blockchain Week has become somewhat of a you know craziness and like you know a lot of people don't like it i i actually you know i like it a lot i think it's like the one week where you get the entire crypto industry in like one city together and even in like the same event right like you know so like consent coindesk consensus is like the centerpiece of this entire thing and then around it you have other events like you have the magical crypto conference which was a very bitcoiner s conference you had um ethereal which is like consensus's thing you have token summit and and then at coindesk consensus is kind of where everyone amalgamates together and like how often do you get like like big bitcoin maximalists in the same room with like eth heads within the same room as like xrp army people and it's like when you get that, you get this cool, like, you know, for example, I know many people may be familiar with that famous bet between Joe Lubin and uh, Jimmy Song about like, you know, in five years, will there be, I think they made it a like some high amount, like I, I don't know off the top of my head, but like I, I think like 60 Bitcoin or something uh, about like, will there be at least five Ethereum dApps with like over 
like a hundred thousand daily active users. I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was like something like that. And so it's like you know you get cool bets like that happening and just cool conversations across. Uh, you know we get this all the time on crypto Twitter, but like it's cool to get those like real life interaction that you really only get when you get all the people in the same room. And I also went to the uh, Magical Crypto Conference, which like you know I I you know tend to find myself more at more like ethereum like events and stuff and it's really cool just chatting with a lot of uh bitcoin bitcoiners there and kind of like you know there's some things about the magic crypto conference that were like the talks were really good and then there's some parts that were like oh okay like they, they, they actually rented a live bull in the uh conference like there was there's was a bull there oh i think it, i saw it, this yeah yeah it was weird i don't know it was like you know they, they were like no student discount tickets but in, we're gonna, we're gonna use all this money to like rent a bull. I don't know in the middle of Manhattan. It, 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 some of some of the things are weird, but uh, the people there were really cool, and it's very interesting. Just like a generally different crowd than I normally hang out with. Like a lot of the people there didn't even know about Cosmos. Like they, they had no clue what it even was. And so I'd actually often introduce myself with like Epicenter because people actually know Epicenter, but not Cosmos. So that was very interesting. Oh, that's funny. Like, it, it, yeah, in, in, a, in a room full of Bitcoin maximalists uh, or people who are really into Bitcoin, how many of them actually are aware of some of these other projects uh, sometimes? Yeah, I, I tend not to travel, um, you know, across oceans to go to conferences. But uh, if you recommend it, uh, maybe I'll consider it next year. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Way cool. less Lambos this year. That was nice. No, no Lambos outside. <laughs> <laughs> OK, maybe maybe we need another bull run. Yeah, so that happens. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for that update. And with that, we'll let's go to our conversation with Jill. Hi. So we're here with Jill Carlson. Jill is the co-founder of the Open Money Initiative. Uh, previously, Jill was at Chain and also worked at Tezos. And so today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things, including her interest in financial regulation circumvention in Venezuela, uh, or, or uh, otherwise known as you know trying to help people in Venezuela who are uh, struggling to um, put food on their table, uh, which has been in the news lately, and how how crypto is is playing a role there. So, hi Jill, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. So, before we get started and start talking about things that will probably uh, attract uh, unwanted attention by a lot of people online and you know, sort of like uh, people who don't agree with certain political views, let's uh, first talk about you and a bit of your background and how you got involved in crypto and got interested in this stuff in the first place. Yeah, sure. So um, I, let's see, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> um, as far back as you'd like to. Okay. So let's see, I grew up in Boston. I went to school and studied history. And then I did exactly what every good liberal arts major does. And I went to work on Wall Street. Um, so my first out of job out of school was as a bond trader uh, at Goldman in New York. Um, and specifically, I was trading Latin American debt and derivatives. So I was trading the bonds or the debt that these countries had issued, including Venezuela, also including Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Latin America, right? So that was that was a good experience. Um, it got me deep into the wild world of economics, political economics. Um, I started to become acquainted with all kinds of issues that countries can have when they're experiencing inflation, when they're defaulting on their debt, when they can no longer pay back their loans. Um, very interesting stuff. Now, how I got into cryptocurrency was actually through this lens and through this same experience of trading, trading sovereign debt. Um, so I had these colleagues who would be on the ground in these various countries who I would catch up with every day, every morning. They would give me kind of the local color of what's going on, et cetera. And in particular, I had a colleague who was based in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. Um, and he calls me up one morning. And at the time, Argentina was going through a debt default. They were also experiencing very high inflation, not hyperinflation, but high enough that it was having an impact. Um, and he calls me up one morning and he says, Jill, you'll never guess what. Like, I finally managed to get my money offshore. 
Um, this guy didn't work at Goldman, so he didn't have like a U.S. bank account. And Argentina at the time also had very strict capital controls in place, um, meaning that you couldn't move your money freely in or out of the country, in or out of the peso if you lived there. In fact, there were people using suitcases to get it across the border, like on boats out from Argentina to Uruguay at the time. That was one of the sort of basic things that people would do to try and get their money out. Um, and he says, you know, I found like a safer, easier way to do this. And this is back in 2013. And I'm like, what? You can probably see where it's going. And he says, oh, well, I bought, I bought Bitcoin with it. And I, at the time was very skeptical. It's like, this isn't backed by anything. I don't think you want to trust this. I don't think this is a good idea. You know, as far as I know, this is just something that people are using to buy drugs on the internet. Um, but he pulled me kind of kicking and screaming down the rabbit hole. Um, I ended up buying some Bitcoin. Again, this was early 2013. So I kind of rode it up in the first hype cycle and it went from, you know, a couple hundred dollars to over a thousand dollars. I wrote it back down. It was like, I'm a huge idiot. I was right all along. Um, but more than anything else, I was kind of inspired to say, okay, if I'm going to own this thing, I'd better understand actually what it is, how it works. And so that's when I started to really dive in and start to learn about it myself. So that was kind of my intro story. Cool. And so how did you get involved with uh, Chain, who at the time were just uh, just starting off, I guess? Yeah. So actually, before I joined Chain, I I went to grad school. I pulled the old grad school ripcord um, and I went to go study development economics at Oxford. Um, at the time, I thought that I wanted to go to a master's degree. I thought that I was going to study a lot of this very straight and narrow stuff that I had been um, sort of experiencing firsthand from the trading desk about sovereign debt sustainability, all of these sort of dry topics in economics. But by the time I got there, I basically, I went into my professors and I was like, so I know that I wrote up this proposal on sovereign debt sustainability in leftist countries and blah, blah, blah. But really what I want to study now, what I want to write my dissertation on is this Bitcoin thing. And as you can imagine, my sort of stodgy economics department professors at, at Oxford were less than impressed. Um, I got a lot of sort of rolled eyes and, you know, this is unprecedented, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of skepticism, um, but did it anyway, realized pretty quickly that a PhD was not in my future, at least anytime soon. So I started applying to pretty much every crypto company that I could find out there. Um, this was 2015, early 2016, and I didn't hear back for most of them. And then the ones who I did hear back from, I got the classic like, yeah, you know, you don't have any experience. You're you're not technical. Um, you know, we're we're not really hiring for like biz dev and operations roles. Um, you don't have any product experience. Blah blah blah. Um, so I, I spent about six months banging banging my head against the wall. Um, but one of the companies that I had my eye on the whole time was Chain, which at the time, as you mentioned, it was going through this sort of pivot from being basically Bitcoin developer tooling to being focused on blockchain for Wall Street, blockchain for enterprise, which felt like kind of a good fit given my background of working on Wall Street. Um, and it actually wasn't until I came across on Facebook of all places, my one of my friends from college, Dan Robinson, updated his like where he works on Facebook to chain that he had just joined chain. And remember at the time, like I I was not working in the space. I didn't really know people in the space. Um, and so I reached out to Dan, of course, and I was like, oh my God, you're into this blockchain thing. I've been really into Bitcoin. Like I wrote this whole dissertation on it. Um, and he hopped on the phone with me and he was like, oh, I, I think the chain is actually hiring. Um, so they, they brought me in and, and the rest is history. Got to work with Adam and that whole team, uh, for, it was only a little over a year. Um, in many ways it felt like longer because I think I learned so much while I was there, but yeah, I had the pleasure of starting off my blockchain career at chain. 
and then you kind of left Chain after a while, and you were working on a couple other projects, like you know, uh, you worked on Tezos for a little while and yeah. stuff. Um, and so, and, and I know, kind of like you know, I think what I, you also got like a lot of popularity as well within the entire space. You you you've written like Popular. a lot of really, yeah, <laughs> you've, you had like a lot of really good posts. I think that like you know, kind of like took a lot of like stuff that was like especially it was like right in like twenty seventeen. There's a lot of hype going on, and like you kind of like broke down things and these blog posts that were like really um, easy to understand. And so, you know, could you like give us like a quick brief, like what's your thesis on blockchains? And, you know, you talk a lot about how like to think about blockchain assets and stuff. So what's your brief thesis on this? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess first I'll give the background of, of how I ended up with these theses and these thoughts, which is that I basically spent several years at this point going down rabbit holes. I think mistakenly often of like, oh, I really want this thing to work and it feels like there's something here. Um, and having to sort of learn from first principles, like where there is a there there and then where there's really not. And actually during my time at Oxford, I worked with a colleague. We were hell bent on starting a crypto company or blockchain startup or whatever. And especially for me, being not coming from a computer science background or whatever, like I had to learn everything, right? And so I, I think that that has that's been a huge detriment in a lot of ways. But I hope that if anything, it's given me the ability to think somewhat clearly about this space and also to be able to express it in a way that's accessible. Um, but so, what is my thesis on? Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. I think that the first thing that people get a little bit confused about is it's very easy to want to apply this technology to anything and everything, right? Like we're going to have blockchain for healthcare records and identity and, um, you know, heads of lettuce being tracked on it, whatever. And I think fundamentally what you have to accept is that it really comes down to just being about assets. It comes down to being about value. Um, and in particular, it comes down to digital assets, digital uh, tokens or units of value. Um, and right then and there, you can rule out just like a lot of the use cases that people talk about. Now, I think that there are aspects of blockchain technology that are applicable to these things like public private key systems, um, you know, distributed computing, like these are all good things. Uh, but and permission databases, you know, whatever you want, like you can take aspects of this. But probably if you're trying to solve a problem with healthcare records or identity, what you're talking about is probably not sort of canonical blockchain technology, as I would talk about it. So that's kind of, I would say, my overarching thesis on this space. So applications that kind of surround the use of uh, assets, like, you know, let's say we're talking about like DEXs, for example, do you think, you know, that's also on the right path or? I, I do. Yeah. DEX is the future. <laughs> that's like sort of my catchphrase. Um, so I think that all of these applications built around assets become suddenly very interesting. Um, now, I think that they become interesting probably in still very sort of specific, possibly very niche use cases today. Um, so use cases where you need some sort of censorship resistance or some level of openness um, that doesn't exist today, i.e. the ability to move sort of across different siloed systems uh, or else areas where you have sort of existing trust issues that exist today. Um, so, I mean, one example that I'll give, and I'll steer this example a little bit away from the sort of Venezuela censorship, censorship resistance stuff, because I know we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. But as the junior kid on a trading desk, I spent a ton of time actually dealing with our back office, dealing with our middle and back office. So these are the folks who do the real work at these big investment banks, right? They're sitting there reconciling all of the trades, making sure that the trades that you've done have gotten cleared and settled properly, making sure that you had the right counterparty on them, making sure that you actually got delivery of the bonds that you're selling to somebody else. Um, and this stuff is a mess. It's 
spaghetti. And it all relies on one central third party, or at least in the bond space it does, which is the DTCC. And for every country, you have your own central securities depository or every region, right? Now, all of these all of these central security depositories, they basically act as this third party intermediary that every single trade has to be routed through. There is never any such thing as JP Morgan just giving direct delivery of the bonds to Goldman Sachs, right? Um, or only very rarely and only in very bespoke cases. And so this was one of the things that actually initially stood out to me about this technology is even forget the censorship resistance thing for a second. If we could find a way where you didn't have to have these literally like 10,000 people at every given bank um, who are keeping track of the books and records and making sure that the Goldman Sachs ledger matches the DTCC's ledger, matches the JP Morgan ledger, and so on and so forth. Like, I think that there is something there. I think that we're still a long ways off from our technology, this sort of next-gen financial technology, blockchain stuff, being anywhere close to being able to compete with the existing system. But that's one of my sort of, like, galaxy brain visions of, of where it all could go. So... Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, having worked uh, for for a couple of years uh, at a at an enterprise startup, I was working on and building uh, traceability systems for for enterprise. Uh, I've come away from that experience with having learned that perhaps the use cases that a lot of people are looking at that aren't in the financial space or aren't like tracking assets probably won't be the ones to pan out first. Um, maybe the maybe those use cases will start to emerge once the sort of more uh, asset tracking type of use cases uh, emerge and are stable. But yeah, definitely, uh, I think like DeFi and distributed finance, and then to some extent, you know, uh, as you say, like simplifying these back office systems uh, are, are probably the ones that are on our. This is one of my weirdest takeaways of of working in this space is that it turns out the world has a really hard time keeping track of stuff. Like <laughs> there are so many of these issues whether it's on Wall Street or in supply chain or you know other big enterprise issues like the world has a really hard time keeping track of ownership and assets. Who would have thought? This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So moving now to uh, to the central topic here, which is Venezuela. Uh, so you mentioned that you were working at this trading desk, trading uh, bonds uh, in, in South America. Did, did you have an interest for you know Latin America and South America before this? Or did you sort of start to get involved and, 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 and interested in, in the political situation there um, with, with this uh, experience? It was really only through that experience. I, to be honest, I don't even speak Spanish. Um, I didn't know basically anything about Latin America until I showed up for for the job. Um, And then, of course, I became intimately familiar with it. But, I mean, even on the trading desk, like, there were a decent number of other folks like me who had no real sort of background uh, or specific interest in in Latin America, but there were also a decent number of people who, you know, were from Mexico or Chile or Peru or wherever, right? 
And the nickname for me on the desk actually just became Gringa, which means like white girl. <laughs> so no, I I had no no real background in it. But obviously, this is this is kind of a, a rabbit hole that that I've now gone down pretty deep. And so, how does that inform you know your your views? So obviously, you're 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 dealing with financial assets that are being traded between banks, and these banks are looking to you know, make the best returns on these assets. And on the, at, at the same time, you're looking at the situation and seeing that you know, in, in some countries in Latin America, or perhaps even the majority of countries in Latin America, people are, by some extent, struggling to get by. How, how does that inform then your political views? And is it common for people to come away from that experience and saying, like, this is kind of messed up? Like, uh, I need to do something about this. I I think yes and no. So, in in the on the desk that I was working on, it was the Latin America desk, but the sort of broader category is called emerging markets. And there are certainly a lot of people who work in emerging markets in finance who feel very sort of mission driven about the whole thing. And there are all of these uh, charity organizations. There's one called EM Power, for example. Um, that does a lot of work there. So I don't want to say that, like, you know, people, you just kind of sit there and do your job and don't think about, like, the implications for folks on the ground. Also, again, a lot of the people I worked with are from these places. Um, I sat across from a Venezuelan guy, right? So there's no way that he's looking at the situation just totally sort of impassively stone-faced. Um, but, I mean, that said... There is, I feel like it's almost probably not to the same extent, obviously, but like almost like a doctor who just sees like trauma patient after trauma patient, right? Where you do become a bit numb at some point to it. And I'll never forget, um, there was at one point fighting that broke out in the Ukrainian parliament, like actual violent fighting. Now this is the Ukraine. So these were sort of my counterparties in Europe who were trading uh, Ukrainian debt um, because they were dealing with like the emerging European countries. Um, but like, I remember everyone just sort of like watching this and being like, oh, yeah, like another day, another dollar, <laughs> another day, another outbreak of violence in with inside of a, a political institution in one of these countries. Um, and yeah, it, it can be, it, it's, it's very, it's a very odd, odd thing. Um, I mean, the other thing that I want to emphasize though here is that like all of these countries are not created equal, right? Like you get these like very extreme moments in time, right? Like Venezuela is experiencing today or clearly like the Ukraine was experiencing at that time. But I mean, that looks completely different from what's going on in Chile, for instance, right? Even though, you know, these countries get sort of lumped together as like, oh, Latin America, and in my case, oh, Latin American debt, like completely different things. And in fact, um, you know, within, within the bond world, you tend to divide debt into two categories. You have high yield debt, which is much more risky and therefore gives you a higher return. And then you have investment grade debt, which is much less risky. And you would put, say, like Apple bonds in that category. Um, now, we were one of the few desks at the entire firm that traded both. And in fact, also traded what's called distressed debt, which, as you can probably figure out, is like high yield to the max. It's like yeah. going through default, going through restructuring. Yeah. So... You know, like you said, so a lot of the current situation, you kind of do have to understand like the context and the history of what got it there. And which is probably why I assume like, you know, your your history background is probably very useful for the trade. I study the ancient history, unfortunately, apropos uh, okay. of nothing. <laughs> I see. Totally I see. useless. So, yeah, could you give us a little bit of a history lesson, uh, you know, brief, like I'm sure we could write textbooks on this, uh, but could you give us a brief idea of like, you know, what happened in Venezuela in the past, like, you know, maybe 20 years that led to the current situation? Because, like, I know 20 years ago, you know, Sebastian was actually just talking to me about it before the show. Like, you know, Venezuela was like 
under Maduro and stuff, people were like, oh, wow. No, sorry, under, oh, sorry, uh, under Chavez. 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 Yeah, not, not Maduro. <laughs> under Chavez, people were like, oh, wow, look at this, like, you know, this, this like, socialist country is, like, succeeding wildly and, like, like you know, this this is the future and whatnot. So what what, what exactly changed? Yeah. So, okay, I want to preface with to do this real justice, you'd have to go all the way back to, like, the Spanish coming in, conquering Latin America and and whatnot. Um, And this is, I think, actually where a lot of the sort of confusion and emotion often comes in is because depending on how far back you go, like Chavez, to many people, was this total hero, right, who came in and sort of empowered the, the people who had been you know, in many ways kind of like oppressed by like these imperialist forces who'd been in the country for a long time. Um, But to many, it was also a socialist dictator. So again, you, you have to kind of frame this with a large degree of nuance and balance. Um, But as you said, you know, if you look back, let's go back just 50 years to start. So in the 1950s, 1960s. Sure. At that time, Venezuela was one of the wealthiest economies in the world. And I think it's really important to emphasize that because people often miss that. They look at it today and they're like, oh, like this, you know, developing country that's like totally backwards and has all of these messed up policies and people are starving, humanitarian crisis. But not that long ago, Venezuela was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Even now, they have more in terms of oil reserves than any other country in the world. And again, people people do a double take when I say that. Sometimes I even start to doubt myself because I'm like, can that possibly be true? But it's actually totally true. Like Venezuela is a very wealthy country in terms of its natural resources. And that's not something that has just been sort of totally squandered, it's actually something that has been used to build up a very modern country and modern society, where if you look at the rates of online banking, for just t- to take an example, that exist in Venezuela, there are more people who use digital banking services in Venezuela in terms of percentage of population than there are in any developed country. Like, Think about that for a second, right? So like rates of sort of these common metrics of development or modernization are actually quite high in Venezuela. And a large part of that is due to Chavez, who you mentioned. So Chavez came to power. He came to power promising all of these sort of socialist policies that were going to start to equalize things. Um, This was in like the early 2000s, late 90s. And indeed, he acted upon those policies um, pretty effectively, if you ask him, certainly, um, in terms of redistributing wealth, um, in terms of coming up with policies and programs that would benefit uh, some of the poorer populations of the country, et cetera. Um, But of course, all of these programs were funded by these oil reserves that I mentioned that exist in Venezuela. And that was all well and good because at the time, through the early to to mid sort of 2000s into 2010s, oil was going through a huge boom, right? You know, if you think about the global macro context of what was going on then, the price of oil, if you went to go fill up your car in like 2003, 2004, the price was going through the roof, right? Um, so that was working out quite nicely, actually, for Venezuela. Now, that gravy train ran out uh, around 2014 when the price of oil collapsed from around $100 a barrel to around $40 a barrel. And this coincided with like the shale boom and the discovery of frack and the sort of uh, taking off of fracking, the discovery of all of these oil reserves actually within the United States, et cetera. Um, but this had a really big impact, of course, on a place like Venezuela, where not only was a huge source of their wealth and their economic growth based on oil, but also basically all of the policies that had been in place for over a decade now were based on oil and the wealth and the price of oil um, that could be derived from the reserves that they have. 
So they kind of assumed that there'd be this constant money coming out of the ground that they could redistribute. And then when that money stopped flowing, then. Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, like, I don't know if it was an assumption that this would last forever or if it was just. Uh, sort of short-term thinking. I mean, there are all kinds of great papers written about politicians and their economic policies and the decisions that they make and the short-term thinking that goes on because they basically just need it, you know, as a politician, you basically just need it to last until your re-election, until your next term, or in the case of Hugo Chavez, until you die. And Hugo Chavez died in many ways at exactly the right moment in terms of this crash. Right. He died, I believe it was 2013. Um, There was actually a long period where no one was sort of sure if he was still alive or dead and there were potentially going to be succession issues. Uh, There was an election called um, and it looked like the opposition candidate. So the guy who would come in with sort of more conservative policies and try to reform um, the socialist system because, you know, there, there was some knowledge of the fact and and discussion of the fact that this gravy train, like I said, wouldn't last forever. Um, And it looked like the opposition candidate was going to get elected. But then lo and behold, uh, Chavez's man, so Nicolas Maduro, uh, got elected. And that is who is still in power today. Um, And he, in your opinion, was that a fair election or was that like, it's, it's debated. your knowledge? It is very much debated. Um, It is less debated that the last election, which occurred just this past year, of whether or not that was fair, that is by and large accepted by the international community as a fraudulent election. I'll give the caveat, the United Nations has actually stood behind that election. Um, So again, there's, you know, there's sort of nuance and gray area here that you have to acknowledge. Um, But I mean, I, I I don't think that it was a free and fair election. Like, if you talk to pretty much any Venezuelan, um, my understanding anyway is that you'll hear just sort of nothing but complaints. But, you know, there also is, you have to be balanced here and you have to acknowledge that there are a lot of people who experience such poverty, even under Chavez, but especially before Chavez, that... They, even with what's going on today, they might say, like, well, it wouldn't be any better under anyone else. Um, so, you know, there are still people, for sure, who who believe that and will say that. But that is not most of the people I've talked to. Again, if you talk to Sebastian or, or most Venezuelans, probably, who you know, they will either laugh or cry at, at that idea, that statement. So... Mm-hmm. When when uh, we're talking about Chavez, I mean, uh, uh, we were talking about this before the show with Sunny. And in fact, in my late uh, teens, early twenties, uh, right when I was a, a a fresh college student, I I followed a friend to invest basically all of my savings at the time in a Canadian gold mining company that had a a potential contract to to mine a whole bunch of gold in uh, in Venezuela and. You know, we we were big fans of Chavez, and we thought like, oh, this guy's so great. And then and then he nationalized the the gold reserves, and uh, and we lost all our money. Not that it was a lot of money, but anyways. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, that'll happen to you when you're when you're investing in stuff in countries like this. Like stuff is just getting nationalized all the time. It's getting seized. It's yeah, you. But I had never I, I a mean, dull it, moment, it, right? It, but, it, it was it was eye opening for me when I. Uh, you know, le- years later, uh, you know, having moved to France and everything, met someone who was from Venezuela and actually met a few people from Venezuela who were like, no, this guy's a crook. Like, you know, Hugo Chavez is a horrible person and a dictator. And from from that point on, like my ideas about this guy, uh, my, my fresh college student ideas uh, of, uh, you know, socialism and everything uh, were toppled on, on their this heads. This is the thing. And I talk about this with my colleague, my co-founder, a guy named Alejandro. Um who, who is Venezuelan, he says this all the time, which is that the word socialism might as well be meaningless at this point because there's a subset of people to whom you say socialist and it means Denmark or it even means like Canada, right? It's like it's not actually. And then there's a certain subset of people to whom you say socialist and it means Venezuela, 
which again, that's like not really, that's not really the intent. Like that is a kleptocracy, right? Like that is a dictatorship. There are tons of other problems going on there. And it, it's this very divisive word and you're seeing this play out now in U S politics of like AOC and the democratic socialist movement, um, of Donald Trump vilifying Venezuela and therefore using that as a means to vilify all of socialism. And of course, like the truth lies somewhere in this messy gray area in the middle. It's not, it's not one or the other. Um, but it is extremely divisive and the amount of, sort of political trolling that you get for even talking about this topic. Well, we'll see in the comments section. I'll just leave <laughs> yeah. That. This is definitely one of the most political, I think topics that we've covered on the podcast, uh, probably. Um, so b- before we get to open money initiative, cause we're running a bit long here, I think we could talk about this for, for quite a while. Um, you know, describe the situation now. And I mean, I, I think most people will, 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 who are following this to some extent, um, are aware of the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, obviously have heard about hyperinflation there. So in your, in your view, what is the situation now? Is it, is it degrading? Is it getting better? Yeah, so it's, it's definitely degrading. There have been sort of glimmers of hope over the last year that things might start to change for the better. Um, but just to, just to lay some context, so... Chavez implemented these socialist policies. Maduro sort of came into power following him, continued on with the socialist policies and the spending programs and so on, um, but by all accounts has mismanaged the the economy. Um, And that has led to all kinds of things. So it's led to uh, hyperinflation. So there's 10 million percent inflation projected for this year. Now, like, what does 10 million percent inflation look like? I talked to a woman through my work with Open Money, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I talked to a woman who told me that she'd worked her whole life, had her whole life savings. She's working in a decent job. Um, She'd saved up enough money for her kids to go to college, blah, blah, blah. But when she left the country, she left to go to Colombia, and she converted her whole life savings. She'd sold her car, sold her house, everything. And it was only worth a couple of thousand dollars in pesos. So that's what it looks like. It looks like your entire life savings has evaporated into, you know, what you're going to need to get by in the next month or two. It also looks like your salary, right, which is set annually. So your salary gets set annually. But that number is inflating at 10 million percent per year. And so what that means is that by month two or month three of the year, what you're getting paid is like not even a reasonable living wage. Even if you're a lawyer, even if you're a doctor, even if you're sort of a professional class of person, because it's getting set at these intervals that just can't even come close to keeping up with inflation in any reasonable way. So it's inflation, it's shortages, um, one of the policies that Maduro has in place is around controlling sort of what can come in or out of the country, what gets imported, and so on. And so you end up with these massive, massive shortages of just basic goods. Like you can't find shampoo there. You can't find body soap. People, we talk to a lot of people who use like dishwasher liquid as body soap because you just can't find it. Um if you're a woman, like you can't find tampons, you can't find just these basic supplies and you definitely can't find medicine. So we also talk to a lot of people who have like elderly parents or, you know, children with, with an illness or whatever, and they just need like basic medicine and you can't find it anywhere. Um, and then the last thing I'll touch on here is the price controls. So price controls and capital controls. So it's very limited what freedoms you have with your money, with your financial life in Venezuela. You don't get to choose what currency you use. It's mandated by the government that you use bolivars. If you're caught with US dollars or with another currency, you could be fined, you could be thrown in jail. And then it's also mandated at what price you sell your goods. And so, for example, we spoke to a farmer who sells coffee or sold coffee. Um, He 
really interesting guy. He loved being a farmer. He lived in this sort of beautiful rural area of Venezuela. Um, and he would sell his coffee beans, right? But it was mandated by the government that he would sell his coffee beans actually at a loss. And he obviously realized this like immediately, right? Like if I sell it at the government mandated price, I'm not going to be able to continue. I'm not going to be able to make a living. Um, and so he would sort of sell it like on the black market at a higher price. The authorities catch wind of this and the authorities would come to his house and beat him and threaten to rape his wife and like literal physical violence if he wouldn't sell it at the mandated price. Um, and eventually he just walked away from the farm and he said, you know what? let it all rot. Like, I would rather this just rot than me sell it at a loss at this insane government mandated price. So these are just some of the dynamics at play. Overarching all of this is just like kind of a lack of rule of law at this point. It's gotten to a point where people are so desperate. Even the police and the authorities, you have to remember, like they're desperate too. Um, and so it's very patchy enforcement of things. When I first started doing research on this topic, like I spent a lot of time actually being like, are people misleading me? Like, are people not telling the truth here? But the reality is, is that everyone's reality there looks so different from the next person's because it just kind of depends on the day and it just kind of depends on, on you know, the policeman that you're interacting with or like who you happen to have access to. And so that, that, that 10 million percent, you know, I just off the top of my head, that sounds like, you know, like almost 150 percent inflation or something yeah. close to that and that means yeah. like you know you wake up no no, no sorry it's 10 million percent inflation 10 million percent right yeah and so that means like on a daily that's about 150 oh, yes. percent daily yeah, 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 yes yeah, uh, yes because it gets compounded and then so like you know that means like, i i can wake up today with like a dollar and by the end by the time i go to sleep it's like 40 cents totally and so what you have is merchants running around their store on like less than an hourly basis, updating prices. And it's gotten to the point where everyone just kind of understands that whatever price is listed is garbage. Like it doesn't even make sense mm -hmm. anymore because it's just constantly changing. Do people so have to have like something that like a, like a, a, a app on their phone that tells them like, oh, this is how much like, you know, the price oh, is well, worth Oh, well, no. Right so this is another issue is that you're not even allowed to list in Venezuela, you're not even allowed to list the Boulevard to U.S. dollar price, which like everyone thinks in U.S. dollars there. That is that is sort of the the default currency. And, and under the table, people will quote things in U.S. dollars like, oh, how much is that bag of sugar? How much is it to get my car repaired? Like that'll be kind of quoted in U.S. dollars. But that's risky, right? Because again, even, even sites that put up what the rate is, between boulevards and dollars, like those are not allowed. And so it, it's these very like underground informal systems. Um, generally what people use is WhatsApp and Instagram and in particular the stories features. And so you'll be connected digitally on WhatsApp and Instagram with all of these people who are either acting as basically informal money changers. Um, so they may they might have access to U.S. dollar bank account and they're acting, again, as, as these sort of informal money changers. They might have access to like goods and food and medicine and they'll go in on their stories and list what they have access to and then the price that they're willing to accept or pay for it. Um, so you have these very, lit quite literally decentralized digital marketplaces that have emerged around this. Right. And so... You know, I think that for the entire, like, kind of to lead into like the o OMI stuff, uh, in the blockchain space, like, there's this like meme that I I'm pretty sure I've said this sentence at some point before, which is like, oh, Bitcoin isn't for like us in the US, it's for people in Venezuela whose money inflated away at 10 million percent a year. But totally. How true is that? Like, is that just a talking point or is that like, so what is the state of, you know, are people actually using Bitcoin in Venezuela like we're purporting or what's the state of adoption there? And Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give a little backstory on, on how I ended up working on this. Um, 
So about a year ago, I I basically, to be honest, had like a bit of an existential crisis around crypto where I was like, I've been working on this stuff for like four and a half years and I still don't know if it's good for any of this stuff that I hope it is. I still don't know like what, it, you know, what it's being used for. Like everyone around me is, you know, as that New York Times headline said, getting hilariously rich. Um, so, you know, I guess I should just be happy about that. But like this doesn't this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel like what I got into the space to do. Um, and so out of that was born a lot of soul searching, first of all, for me of like, okay, what do I actually still believe is true here? And the thing I kept coming back to was that conversation with my Argentine colleague who used cryptocurrency as basically an escape hatch from his system that was failing him. Um, and I came back to Sunny, exactly what you're saying. Like, how many times have I sat up on a panel, some blockchain conference, and said, oh, you know, Bitcoin, it's, it's not for us, it's for people in Venezuela who hyperinflation and price controls and capital controls and so on. Um, but to be honest, I, I was kind of sitting there like, I actually don't know if this is true. And I was lucky enough to link up with a couple of people who were sort of having similar thoughts and coming at it from a similar perspective at the time. So I mentioned Alejandro Machado already. Um, he is Venezuelan. He's done a bunch of interesting work in the crypto space himself. Uh, and then another guy named Jamal Montessor, who is a design researcher, was until recently a design researcher at IDEO. Um, and the three of us basically just got together and we were like, let's go, let's go figure this out. Let's go see if there's something here. And more importantly, let's figure out what we as an industry, not necessarily we, the three of us, but like we as an industry could build or do in order to make this be useful. And so we started to sort of design the research that we wanted to do. We decided very quickly that this wasn't like an academic sort of quantitative research project. The question to us is not like, oh, well, what percentage of Venezuelans are using Bitcoin? Or, you know, what percentage of Venezuelans have heard of DAI? Like, the real question is, how are people using it today? In the cases where they're not using it, how are they surviving? How are people hacking the system? And then how can we take a combination of these insights to develop some concepts and design principles and so on that could actually lead to real products and services. And so with all of that, the Open Money Initiative was born. Um, so we run ourselves as a nonprofit. We're very lucky to be sponsored by folks like Cosmos uh, and Tezos, who I did previous work with as well, uh, the Zcash Foundation, Stellar, and then also the Zcash company, Zuko Wilcox, has been a huge part of the whole story. Um, so we decided to undertake this research, as I said, to go and figure out sort of what, what this looks like, what it looks like on the ground. We spent a bunch of time at the beginning of 2019, not on the ground in Venezuela, but on the ground in Colombia, um, and spent a bunch of time on the border between Colombia and Venezuela, which is basically as good as you can get if you are a U.S. citizen or if you are, in Alejandro's case, a Venezuelan who is not trying to get stuck back in the country. Um, and we spent a lot of hours interviewing people, doing sort of these like ethnographic, most anthropological interviews with people, both who use cryptocurrency and many more who don't um, in their daily lives. We also ran a series of studies um, so, for example, one study that we ran was we distributed Bitcoin to a whole group of people, again, a handful of whom had used crypto before, most of whom had not, because we wanted to see the hurdles that they would have to go through in order to even receive the cryptocurrency, let alone to then use it, to spend it, so on. Um, so I, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of nuance to all of this. It's very hard to distill down into just a few key insights. Um, but if I were to try to, to answer your questions, honey, like, yes, people are using it in Venezuela. People are using specifically Bitcoin in Venezuela. No, the number of people using it is not nearly as high as 
our industry would like to believe. No, it's not pulling the country out of poverty in any sort of meaningful way, but it is serving as basically, as I said, an escape hatch, right, for a fairly small but nonetheless significant subset of people in the country. Um, And so I started to mention it's really just Bitcoin that's being used there now. Uh, And it's actually really just local Bitcoins that's being used as the product. Um, So in fact, as we were doing this research, we as Open Money got in touch with local Bitcoins and we were kind of like, hey, do you guys realize that like your tool is totally saving lives here? Um, And we're actually now undertaking a whole sort of study and, and project with local Bitcoins as well. So it's been it's been an interesting journey. Happy to dive into anything and everything. Yeah. Do, do you have an idea of, I mean, I guess maybe local Bitcoins has some of this data, but do you, do you have an idea of the volume that's being traded there, you know, on a daily basis or? Yeah, I, I don't have the latest numbers from local Bitcoins, but my sense is that the local Bitcoins volume is probably very close to the entire volume. Like people... People aren't using, at least as far as we saw, it's not common for people to be using other tools. There are some other tools that yeah, allow there's like BISC and these other kind of decentralized. Yeah, and then there's platforms. also like RTM, which is in many ways a bit more centralized than than local bitcoins, um, but in a way that also allows them to provide kind of like better customer support and customer service, and they have a pretty big. Uh, population and presence in Venezuela. So there are a handful of others. Um, but today, my sense is it's primarily that local Bitcoin's volume, which is pretty substantial. Um, it's consistently one of the highest volumes by currency that ha- that gets traded on local Bitcoin's period. So if that tells you anything. Who wants the uh, Bolivars? Like, so is it that like merchants are not allowed to accept Bitcoin? Like, yeah. they're required to accept Bolivars? Like, who's trading? Who's selling the Bitcoin there? Yeah. So this is one of the weirdest things, um, or to me, was one of the most surprising things that I learned, which is that it's totally true that nobody wants the Bolivar. Like, nobody wants to hold on to that thing, but you still need it just to survive your day to day life. And so a lot of it, as you just said, Sonny, has to do with this government mandate that you can only use the boulevard. Um, And that makes it so that many merchants, the incentive is just not there to accept other forms of payment. But now all of those merchants on their back end, they're figuring out how to get rid of those boulevards that they've just accepted from their customers as quickly as possible, whether that's to buy more goods, uh, whether that's to get it somehow into US dollars. So it's basically this gigantic game of hot potato that everyone is playing with the local currency where nobody wants to hold on to it for too long. But just to stay in the game, you've got to hold it at some point. The question I have here is, is Bitcoin really the right solution to this? Like, are, do people really want this like decentralized cryptocurrency that's like, you know, or do they or is what they want really just access to dollars, which we're kind of seeing now through these like stable coins that are being released? Like, you know, the Bolivar may have lost like 10,000% uh 10 million percent in the last year but you know bitcoin still lost 80 percent which is you know not not quite on even i'll take bitcoin closer. any day <laughs> yeah of course i take bitcoin any day over uh, uh the bolivar but like you know i'd still prefer in that case i'd prefer die yeah. or usdc over um uh, bitcoin and so really is bitcoin the, what, the solution that we should be looking for here or should we be figuring out how to get more access to global financial system to people there I think the answer to that whole question is yes, like both. Okay. And, you know, this this question of what is it that people actually want, you're spot on. Like people don't want Bitcoin. They don't want a local Bitcoin's wallet. They don't want like decentralization to the max. What they want is a U.S. dollar bank account. 
to a person, when we asked people this question, that's what they said. And one of the exercises that we did with the folks we sat down with actually was this card sort exercise where we would give them note cards with all of these different assets on it. And we would have them rank them in terms of, you know, what would you most prefer to have your savings in? What would you most prefer to be able to use in your day-to-day life? So on. And pretty much to a person, there was one young woman who ranked Bitcoin first. But other than her, to a person almost, it was US dollars first. And so what does that tell us? To me, that tells me that there probably is a place for a US dollar pegged stable coin. But then you ask the question, why aren't people using that today? And the biggest point that it comes down to is liquidity. Right. Because we're not yet living in a situation where people are going and spending their digital currencies directly. Like of those who have Bitcoin there, they're not going to their merchant and using Bitcoin to buy bread directly. They're cashing it out into their local currency. And so the existence of local Bitcoins and the fact that local Bitcoins has a high degree of liquidity on it, I think, is what keeps Bitcoin as the sort of shelling point there and the thing that people are using over other assets that may have, you know, attributes that that Bitcoin doesn't that they want. And it's, for me, it's really reframed actually completely how I think about money and how I think about what is and is not money. Because the question is never, is this money? It's, how good is this at being money for my purposes right now? And there are all of these different aspects to it, whether that's stability, redeemability, convertibility, how easily can I spend this thing? Uh, What does the uptime versus downtime of the actual system look like? And you see this very explicitly, for example, in the US dollar presence in Venezuela. And what I mean by this is the following, which is that five $20 bills in Venezuela they're actually worth more than one $100 bill because it's divisible, right? And you're more likely to be able to spend an entire $20 bill and not have to worry about getting change back in boulevards than if you have a $100 bill. And so there are all of these different knobs that you're suddenly turning, whether we're talking about Bitcoin and DAI, whether we're talking about different denominations of USD cash or whatever it is that really matter when you go to a scenario that's as extreme as this. You know, there's another project, uh, you know, I think Coinbase kind of like heavily funds them called uh, Give Crypto. And I think it was actually founded by uh, uh, Brian Armstrong as well. And so, you know, they tried to do this thing. I remember last uh, December where they were kind of like, I don't know, I'd call it airdropping Zcash to uh, some some families in Venezuela. I think it was like one dollar a day or something like that. And so do you one, do you think that's the right approach or and to you know why zcash in that case like you know coinbase usdc is their product or partially their product and so or or you know like you said bitcoin has more liquidity so what what do you think was the motive between behind like airdropping zcash so is I, privacy important is, is there yeah. privacy concerns that like you know or is the venezuelan government sophisticated enough to like know how to trace the Bitcoin, and that's why Zcash is useful there. Privacy is definitely a concern. Um, We're not yet at a point where the government is, like, employing sort of chainalysis-style techniques to track Bitcoin transactions. But certainly, you know, that company that I mentioned, RTM, they they have agents, basically cash-in, cash-out agents, on the ground in Venezuela. And at one point, a whole bunch of them uh, came under threat from the Venezuelan government, had to get evacuated by the RTM team from the country. Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely an issue of privacy. But again, we're not yet at a point where it's relevant to think about uh, sort of on-chain privacy. Um, in most cases, more likely you're going to be leaking uh, through other through other methods and forms and and forms of communication in particular. So, you know, I can't I can't speak to sort of the the value of using Zcash in in that scenario. Um I'm familiar with Give Crypto. I'm I'm friends with Joe who runs it. Like I think that a lot of what they're doing is great. 
Um, I think that there's a lot of value in just sort of the more studies that we can run in these circumstances, the more knowledge we'll have as to like what works and what doesn't. And I appreciate that Give Crypto, I think, has been very humble in their approach to all of this of saying like, we're doing a bunch of experiments and we're trying to learn right now so that when we roll something out in in size and at scale, like it can have the intended impact, which of course is this like very positive mission-driven impact. My sort of philosophy on it is is a bit different, which is that I think that, you know, if you if you give some, if you just airdrop someone some Zcash or some Bitcoin or whatever it is. Like, all you've really succeeded in doing is giving that person some crypto, right? And, like, you don't know what the end result is going to be, what the end impact is going to be. You don't know yet how that fits in to their life and their needs. Um, You don't yet understand the why of the decisions that they're making on a day-to-day basis. Um, And that's really where I wanted to start was... What do people's lives look like today? What are the problems that they're facing? And then how can we think really critically about where the technology that we have, be it cryptocurrency or not, might fit into the solutions that that can be provided um, as, you know, potential tools in in what people are trying to do on a day-to-day basis. Um, so it's just two sort of very different approaches. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, there's there's actually a decent amount of activity going on around cryptocurrency and Venezuela, whether it's Give Crypto, Dash has done a ton of sort of marketing and education there. Um, there's, there's a lot of these types of projects. Randy Brito, if you follow BTC Ven, Bitcoin Venezuela, um, very active on Twitter, but also another great example of someone having a real impact on the ground. And um, with him, he accepts Bitcoin and cryptocurrency donations and then cashes them out, I believe via local Bitcoins, although I'm not sure, um, cashes them out locally and then uses that money to buy food to to give away to people. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of activity, lots of experiments. And, and another crypto project that's kind of tangentially related to this whole discussion is is the Petro. And yes. we don't have to bring this up earlier, but you know, uh, as as we've got a couple minutes here left for the end of the show, maybe talk about how the Petro fits in all this context. Uh, you know, so for those who don't remember, the Petro was a, an ICO, which was effectively done by the uh, Venezuelan government, I, I believe, in 2017, as sort of you know pushback on the U.S. and uh, on the U.S. dollar specifically, is sort of like the exchange currency for 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 petrol. Um, so uh, yeah, what's the story there, and how is it related to all of this? And yeah, the petro is one of the more sort of insane dystopian stories to come out of cryptocurrency, in in my view. Um, so as you mentioned, the petro was thought up, dreamed up, and and created, if you will, uh, back in 2017, shortly after Venezuela um, defaulted on their debt, and also pretty long, actually, after sanctions had been put in place on the Venezuelan government. Those sanctions actually date back to Barack Obama put them in place. Um, and so those sanctions state that, okay, Venezuela, the government of Venezuela can't go out into the world and raise money basically until they clean up their act. Now, when the government of Venezuela defaulted on their debt, this created a huge issue because normally when a country defaults on their debt, what they do is they negotiate with their bondholders and they say, okay, you know, we'll pay you back the same amount, but over a longer period of time and so on and so forth. Um, If you look at like the Greek debt restructuring that happened in like 2010-ish, that's exactly what happened. That's a great example of this. But in the case of Venezuela, because of the sanctions, right, they couldn't have those negotiations. And so they suddenly found themselves totally locked out, like country non grata with all of these investors. Um, And so they have no mechanism of financing themselves with outside capital anymore. 
And of course, this was 2017. This was the year of the ICO, uh, which to most means initial coin offering. Um, But as my friend Casey coined to Venezuela meant initial country offering. Um, And so they decided to attempt to issue their own token, uh, basically, I think, in order to evade the sanctions that the United States had put in place. And so the Petro was born. Um, They... They went, I mean, they took the whole thing pretty far, right? Like, they wrote up a white paper on it. There are all of these very dystopian images of this dictator, you know, the the guy in charge of Venezuela sitting in front of, like, this big sort of coin with a P on it, stands for Petro. Um, They claimed initially that the Petro was backed by oil reserves that are still in their ground. Then at another point, they said, actually, no, it's backed by that and our gold reserves. Like, they've they've sort of changed tactics a bunch of times on it. At one point, it was being built on Ethereum, and then they switched to NEM. Um, and there's also been a lot of confusion around like, what it's for and how much they've raised. So the Venezuelan government at one point put out the number, I believe it was like 700 million that they'd raised. Um, at another point, they put out the number $5 billion that they'd raised. As far as any of us can tell, they probably didn't raise anything, actually. Um, Donald Trump actually came out with an executive order and said that the Petro is also sanctioned. So then suddenly, like, no one is going to touch it. Um it, you know, I don't. Yeah, so you can't even been... you can't even have it on a crypto exchange effectively because as a no, sanctioned totally. asset, yeah. it, it is subject. Well, if you if you're running a crypto exchange, you're subject to KYC, uh, or you're subjecting your 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 users to KYC, and so those users can't. Yeah, trade and you a do not mess asset. with OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is the office within the United States that deals with sanctions enforcements, like you do not mess with them. So exactly. They're not listed. So on just on, on, on the yeah. amount. Uh, it, so if they did an, an ICO or some sort of a fundraise, could we just, uh, you know, how, how, how do they raise this money uh, presumably? And can we just audit that so, on blockchain somehow? I mean, if, if they had raised in Bitcoin or ETH, say, then you could do like the blockchain audit of like what was going into the Venezuelan accounts, etc. Um, but that's not how they did it. They had they put up like a web form that you could like fill out and like click buy on things. Um, as far as I remember, they did have like some some form where you could go in and pay. Um, although that came up later and like the website was down for a long time. So there was like a lot of confusion around this. Um, but if they did raise anything, those transactions were like off chain, right? And so there okay. isn't really a good way. But it also, though, it gets really sketchy if you look at the Petro blockchain. I say that because, like, I don't know, it's not actually decentralized. Um, but if you look at sort of the movements of these Petro tokens, like, it looks like it, there's just like a lot of like laundering going on within. The government's own wallets and that it's primarily just the government's wallets that actually hold these things but then you also hear this very confusing conflicting information of like i've spoken to people who told me that they logged into their pension accounts their venezuelan pension accounts that are obviously like related to government accounts um and that suddenly what was formerly de- denominated in bolivars in there is denominated in petro but like no one has a really good sense of what a petro is worth, where you can spend it. Um, the Venezuelan government has said at various times that if you want to renew a passport, you have to use petro to be able to pay the <laughs> fee to renew your passport. But like again, no one really knows like how to get a petro or like what it's worth. So it's just this very like Kafka esque nightmare <laughs> of like monetary experimentation gone bad i would say so so this all backfired the day that donald trump issued an executive order effectively making this an illegal asset and so therefore this this whole plan to use the petro to circumvent u.s regulation or u.s financial sanctions also backfired that's that's my take on it that's my sort of understanding of what likely went on here um but as with 
all things having to do with the Venezuelan regime. Like, it's so hard to say what's actually going on. Um, it's so hard to say what the actual intent was. That, yeah. Back when the uh, Petro uh, came out, you know, I was having some discussions with some friends and, you know, we were, we were like, wait, this is like, very mind blowing in a way because you know the current instantiation was just this, like you know Venezuelan shitcoin that they're ICOing in order to fundraise, but it got us thinking about like you know what the, the, a, a concept of a Petro seemed interesting, something that's backed by gold and or, or sorry backed by oil or and so you know we were thinking like you know what if blockchains give the ability for all of the like different OPEC countries to like coordinate and launch a coin that's like a cryptocurrency that's like you know the pro you know it's it's designed to be the primary way to buy oil whether it's like you know discounted or you know it's the only thing you can use to buy oil and you know would like such a thing have the ability to like you know there's this term called the petrodollar which is like you know the u.s yeah. dollar gets its value by being the one a lot of its value from, by being the primary thing you need to buy oil with um, and so do you think that is like, have you even heard any rumors of like such a thing? And do you think that's actually a feasible concept? I, so I haven't heard any rumors of such a thing. I think it's really interesting, though, because, you know, for the first time we have the ability to just mint assets, right? Like in this in this new sort of way where you can... Um, and all you these know. different sovereign nations in OPEC can coordinate to do that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you certainly do have this dynamic of a lot of countries uh, disagreeing with the dollars, the U.S. dollars reserve status. So, you know, for example, you have China and Chinese entities issuing debt, not in dollars or in another sort of reserve-ish currency, but denominated in special drawing rights or SDRs, which is like the IMF neutral basket of currencies. So could I imagine a world in which you have OPEC sort of doing something similar and trying to find or trying to create rather their own neutral asset to be able to receive payments for, for oil? Like, yeah, totally, totally. I, I think it's I think it's super interesting. As you said, very dystopian the way that it's been sort of playing out in Venezuela and also just very inept, to be honest. Like the execution has been very poor. Um, but I think that I, I do think that there's something there. And and I have long been kind of like beating this drum of no, the Petro is actually really important to look at because you can start to view it as uh, a precursor to a lot of these other sorts of like sovereign esque use cases of crypto. Um, again, whether that's like good, bad, ugly, totally up for debate. And this is to, to zoom out a little bit further, actually, this is something I, I want to bring up that I always like to highlight is like, you know, with the work that I'm doing with the Open Money Initiative, et cetera, it's very easy for me to sort of like wax poetic about, you know, Bitcoin, local Bitcoins. It's like, it's helping this subset of people in Venezuela, but like, you know, who else is using it is the government is like the corrupt government administration for sure. Or also mining Bitcoin using cryptocurrency to get their money out of the country, et cetera. Um, and so it, it's, it's this real issue of like, you know, we can, dream up all of these ideas and come up with all of these ways that these tools can be used. But at the end of the day, we don't get to choose who's using them or how they're getting used. And yeah, whether it's like OPEC or Venezuela or whether it's, you know, the people or the government or whatever it is, like that is, that is definitely something that keeps me up at night. So. I wanted to ask you one last question about open money initiative before we wrap up here. Uh, and, and that is with regards to your political views and how they inform, say, ethics about you know, the, 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 the activities of that organization. So in a country like Venezuela, I, I think you know, we can all agree that the, uh, there's, a human, there's a humanitarian crisis there and people are in need. And I think it's easy to defend you know, 
educating people about Bitcoin and allowing them to do something as simple as like feeding their kids, right? Like putting food on the table. But I, I believe your mission uh, on your website or to, is to something to the effect that you know you you believe that open financial systems are a human right. Um, you know, for Venezuela, it might be clear cut, but in the future, there might be other cases where, you know, helping people circumvent um, their country's capital controls is a bit more of a gray area. You know, capital controls, some might argue, are useful in some cases um, to help stabilize an economy, for instance. Like, I'm not an economist, but I could I could definitely see how that would be the case. You know, how do you how do you look at that and how do you make decisions about you know what is ethically okay and what is not if you know people if you're encouraging people to per- perhaps like break the law and um, circumvent their country's capital yeah control- yeah controls. no there are a lot of considerations there um there are con- the considerations that you just outlined but also there's the issue of like look using bitcoin in venezuela is a huge gray area right like it's it's very patchily enforced but like we've heard of instances where people have been punished either with fines or jail time or sometimes physically um with using any of this stuff and or rather excuse me for using any of these types of products and tools um and so there's also then the issue of like okay if we are if we are trying to build tools that make it easier for people to use this then is that potentially putting them in harm's way? And so that's yet another aspect of this that is really hard and problematic. Um, Now, I'll say for the Open Money Initiative itself, our aim is to just present the world as we find it. We're doing research, right? Um, Our aim with that research is to be as neutral as possible, um, yes, there is this underlying fundamental mission of, of trying to build a more free and more open and more fair financial system for people who don't have access to that today. Um, but we are not, we are not like an activism organization. We are not even a product organization. We're a research organization. Um, so that's kind of my first answer. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I fully agree with that. I mean, if if you have an organization like um, this Give Crypto organization that you partner with, you know, perhaps you're not being active in activism, but you know, you're partnering with organizations that kind of are we're on providing, the line there. Yeah, we're providing research to other organizations, the Human Rights Foundation, which is very controversial, Give Crypto, um, you name it. Uh, local bitcoins, as I mentioned earlier, and so absolutely, I mean, we we consider who we're working with, and we consider whether or not the potential directions that they go align with what we believe, and and so here I'll get into sort of what I personally believe, which is that evasion of capital controls has been around since capital controls have existed. Um, This was actually what I ended up writing my master's thesis on was not just Bitcoin, but evasion of capital controls in general. Um, Now, historically, those who've been able to evade capital controls in their given countries, it's been big multinational organizations. It's been the executives of those types of companies. Um, It's been the government officials themselves. It's been the sort of upper echelon elite classes of those countries who have the ability to get an offshore account in the Caymans or even in the United States, whatever it is. Um, And that has left behind huge swaths of the population who not always, not like capital controls are not just blanket bad, but very frequently get left behind. Um, And so, you know, it's one of these things where you have to look not just at sort of in theory, how does this play out, but the reality of it. And the reality of it is that there are huge groups of the populations who are finding ways with or without cryptocurrency to evade policies that they deem as not beneficial to them personally or to their company or even to their country as a whole. Um, So that's one big aspect of it. And then 
you know, the other aspect that I would point to is just there is a reason why why we're starting in Venezuela here. And of course, you know, our our vision for the research that we're doing in the project is not uh, solely just about Venezuela. But if I were to look at sort of the the different places where these sorts of policies are playing out, Venezuela is among the most extreme, certainly. And also, to me, among the most sort of clearly, clearly there is a need here, right? And that comes back to the humanitarian crisis that's playing out, um, the refugee crisis that's now playing out. More people as a percentage of population, more people have left Venezuela in the last few years since the crisis began than even the population of Syria. So the refugee crisis in Venezuela is actually bigger than that of Syria. And to me, like, there is just this very clear, dire, desperate need there. Um, And so that is one of the more clear situations as you, as you yourself just mentioned. And that is a huge part of why, why that's where we're beginning. So it's a noble, uh, noble cause to be working. (laughs) So yeah. um, Where can people find you? Uh, Yeah. Please plug your podcast uh, as well. (laughs) Yeah. Oh God. Um, So uh, for more information on the open money initiative, it's just openmoneyinitiative.org or on Twitter at Make Open Money. Um, we'll be coming out with a whole series of blog posts and papers and so on, sharing the research that we've done, sharing our findings. Um, if you want to find me, I am very much on Twitter, uh, at underscore Jill Ruth is my handle. Um, and then I also, yeah, I, I, I also help run my own podcast with Meltem Demirers. Um, it's called What Grinds My Gears. So by all means, check that that out as well. I'm not sure we keep it quite as professional as you guys do on this show, but we have a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for joining us today. And uh, and uh, it was great to learn about everything you, you, you're doing with the Open Money Initiative and also to you know, dive into this, uh, this very complex topic, which is Venezuela. And uh, I think uh, is worth looking at, uh, you know, depending, you know, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, we're not a political show at all, uh, you know, but um, uh, I think it does, uh, you know, merit some some attention at least from uh, the perspective of uh, you know the humanitarian the humanitarian crisis at least if anything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me on. This is great. Thanks, Joe. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.